welcome to the North American Ag Spotlight. I'm Chrissy Wozniak. My guest today is Director of Government Affairs and Mar Market Regulatory Policy for the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. He's been a regular lately on Ag Spotlight, and today we're going to be talking about the House passing two NCBA back bills on market transparency. I'd like to welcome back Tanner Beamer. Welcome, and thanks so much for being here. You bet, Chrissy. Always good to be back. Yeah. So first of all, can you tell me a bit of background about the two bills? Yeah, so the first bill was a it was brought by House Agriculture Committee Chairman David Scott, and that is to extend the authority for livestock mandatory reporting through to September 30th of 2022. Uh, LMR is a very essential market transparency program that is run by USDA and cattle producers use the information that comes from that program to make marketing decisions, better inform business decisions, and in some cases to set the base prices for fed cattle transactions. So that's a very critical uh, program at USDA, and it does require congressional reauthorization every five years. Uh, the most recent uh, reauthorization effort occurred in September of 2020, which is when the program was originally set to expire. It got a temporary extension to last September through the appropriations process, and it was uh, reauthorized again, but only temporarily via the continuing resolution that's currently funding the government through February 18th of 2022. This legislation, however, gives us a little bit more certainty and extends that deadline out until next fall. So if we uh, have new policy that comes out of our uh, national convention and our meeting where our members will vote on policy that advocates for specific changes to LMR, we have a little bit of time to advocate for those changes uh, with this new September 30th deadline. So we were pleased to see that get over the finish line in the House and now see it go on to the Senate. And then additionally, there was a bill brought by Congressman Dusty Johnson, who's a Republican from South Dakota, and Henry Cuellar, a Democrat from Texas, uh, called the Cattle Contract Library Act. And that's something that our industry has been working on for a pretty substantial amount of time now. And it would establish and maintain a library of all the contracts made available by packers to producers for the purchase of fed cattle. Um, and it would warehouse that library in a searchable format at USDA. Now, that library, of course, would be a little bit more high level than, say, uh, a, a contract between a packer and a feeder with just the identifying names redacted. Uh, it would be subject to aggregation, which is pretty standard with livestock mandatory reporting, and then also would be subject to USDA's rules of confidentiality to prevent any sort of uh, leverage sways back to the packer uh, in, in, in the case of you know, being able to see what they're doing compared to what other people are doing. So it's a great market transparency tool. It'll allow producers to kind of see what options are available to them, what qualities in cattle are being incentivized and are fetching a premium so that they can, again, take that information and make whatever adjustments they see fit on their individual businesses. So we were glad to see that get over the finish line in the House as well. Absolutely. And uh, the House voted for 418 to 9. Uh, to advance um, HR 5290 and the, the Cattle Contract Library Act, um, the House passed with overwhelmingly 411 to 13. So were you surprised at the bipartisan support it received? You know, I, I really wasn't. Uh, these are two legislative proposals that have gotten a lot of support, both on Capitol Hill with lawmakers and out in the industry. You know, it's no secret that when it comes to marketing cattle, there are a lot of different opinions on what the best way to approach some of these uh, bills that we've seen introduced lately. But the cattle contract library is one that virtually everybody can agree upon because it is a, a useful market transparency tool. And I think one of the reasons you saw it move through the legislative process so quickly was because it had such widespread support from livestock groups that don't always see eye to eye with one another. Um, it moved from being introduced to getting marked up by the House Agriculture Committee on a unanimous voice vote in 48 hours. And I think that's why you saw such magnanimous support for it. Uh, when it came up for a vote in the House yesterday. And livestock mandatory reporting, I mean, the results speak for themselves. This program has been wildly successful and very popular with producers ever since it was uh, teed up in 2001. Uh, and Congress, like I said, every five years since then has reauthorized it in some form or fashion because it is such a successful tool. Um, so those vote margins, uh, I think, are really, uh, really a good uh, indication of what Capitol Hill is doing. They're listening to feedback from stakeholders and they're moving forward with those proposals, which have the most support uh, from the affected groups. And uh, hopefully the Senate will take note of that as they start to consider some of these various proposals going into next spring. That's great. And the, the current relationship between major meat packers 
and um, and the producer. It has been tense lately. So do you think these bills will lessen this tension? You know, by itself, no, because I wouldn't say that these bills are silver bullets. But when we couple them together with some of the other things we're working on, improving and increasing processing capacity, improving price discovery throughout the entire marketplace, you know, those those in concert together will, I think, start to swing leverage back to cattle producers. And then also there's just some dynamics that are at play in the market. We're experiencing a herd contraction right now at the same time that there are a lot of small regional independent processors that are adding capacity right now. And uh, I, I just came from a meeting with cattle facts, looking at some market forecasts. And I think that particularly at the cow calf sector, we can expect to see a welcome change from the last several years in terms of uh, break evens and profitability. Well, that's good to hear. And you're from a farming background. What are you hearing from back home from from those farms? You know, a lot of a lot of those folks are are very curious about where we're going next, right? So contract library and livestock mandatory reporting reauthorization are only two proposals out of a vast uh, amount of options on cattle markets. You've got this Fisher Grassley bill. Um, which would, among other things, mandate certain levels of participation in the negotiated market, uh, which is different by region. Um, there's a lot of questions about how that would work. Uh, there's a lot of questions about whether or not the Justice Department is going to conclude its investigation into the meat packers to see if there was any anti-competitive behavior in the aftermath of those two most recent black swans, being, of course, the Holcomb fire and, and uh, COVID-19. Um, I'm from Idaho, uh, which is in the West, very arid, very, very drought stricken. So a lot of the questions I get asked are, you know, drought related in, in nature. And a lot of that also has to do with kind of where you're seeing some movement of cattle, right? A lot of that herd contraction I was talking about can be attributed to those places where there is a pretty heavy drought. So producers are trying to think outside the box. Um, I, I spoke to a group in my home state not that long ago where I found out that 30% of the folks in that room, most of whom are cow-calf producers, retain ownership of those cattle beyond just the cow-calf level, uh, which is a much higher figure than I would have anticipated. And I think that that speaks to, A, the availability of regional processing. There's a plant going up in Southern Idaho uh, that a lot of these folks are, are very excited about. And, and that's one of the reasons I think that's uh, leading that retained ownership to come up. Um, but the other thing that kind of goes along with that is just it's it's a it's a better way to manage risk and and capture some additional leverage and profitability for that sector. So um, a lot of a lot of questions about where we go from here. Um, but I think uh, by and large, at least from the conversations I've been having, uh, there is a, a renewed sense of optimism that perhaps we haven't had to this degree for the last two some odd years. Yeah, that's awesome. So so what's next in the in these processes? Yeah, so both of these bills that we talked about have to go to the Senate. Um, I, I do not expect that there will be a lot of movement over there from now to the end of the year. Congress is about to adjourn for recess to observe the holidays. Uh, and then once they get back, they've got their plate full trying to fully fund the government. And they have a debt ceiling uh, that they need to vote to raise or not. Um, there's, a, there's a full list of things that the Senate has to get through, but I believe that the Agriculture Committee will take a serious look at these proposals. And like I said, uh, we would be hopeful that they would focus on those uh, proposals that have very wide uh, support and uh, in pretty much consensus uh, within the industry. Right. Yeah. And with everything else on their plate, this seems like low hanging fruit just to get it done, right? <laughs> Oh, absolutely. I mean, yeah. the proof is in the pudding. The, the the way it moved through the House, the margin that it received when the vote came to call, uh, I think that this is a pretty easy, uh, a pretty easy layup, assuming that we're not going to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Right. Yeah. So what else is uh, NCBA trying to address in government going forward? Um, are you looking forward to, to anything? What should we be expecting? You know, I think that uh, we are concluding what is a, typically a very busy legislative year. And then as we go into next year, uh, all of the House is in cycle. And next November, we're going to have a midterm election. Uh, and I think that that's probably going to result in a lot less time spent in Washington, a lot more time spent out in home districts. You got a third of the Senate that's in uh, re-election as well. And this is a very critical midterm. Uh, currently, the Democratic Party controls all three levers of the, the legislative and the executive branch. And so I think that that 
that's uh, something that the Republicans are eyeing very hard and they're going to want to spend as much time as possible back home campaigning. Um, so in terms of in terms of cattle market policy, I would expect to see um, movement on a, a host of issues once we come back in January after the new year. Uh, but once you get past about April or May, uh, Congress starts to get pretty dead because people start to want to spend more time back in their districts. Definitely. Yeah, it'll be the season of grab your popcorn and <laughs> and watch what happens in 2022, right? <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much um, for joining me again. Thanks for the analysis. It's always great to, to stay on top of what's happening in Washington. You bet. Absolutely. Always a pleasure to chat with you. Yeah. And thanks to all who are watching or listening. If you want more information, links are provided in the show notes. Don't forget to subscribe to North American Egg Spotlight on YouTube and Rumble. And the podcast is available on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, Amazon, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks so much and have a great day. 